Good afternoon. My name is Doran Mace. Sorry I can't be here today, but I did want to share a bit of rural history on food web modeling of nearly two and a half decades. As you'll see, this history contains several different modeling approaches to address a range of questions in the Great Lakes and other ecosystems. I'll progress through this history by first briefly describing some of our modeling approaches. Then I'll highlight some milestones seen here as by the numbers. Next, I'll provide some research highlights, and these are teasers, so hopefully I'll garner enough interest from some of you that you go and read our manuscripts. Then some outreach products, then I'll wrap it up with what's next. Our approach to the years has been an ensemble based modeling approach, ranging model complexity from simple to complex. These efforts address issues of establishment of invasive species and responsive communities, food web, and regional economy, common economies to anthropogenic stressors. Models have included spatially explicit bioinject models for quantifying habitat quality and quantity, community individual based or agent based models, ecological and social network analysis, and using established modeling frameworks, including ecopathic ecosyn and the Atlantis ecosystem three dimensional modeling framework, and fully linking some of these models to economic models. Note that the Atlantis framework integrates like physics, biogeochemical cycling, and food web interaction, and is the most complex of all our approaches. Outlined in this table is how we have used these models for understanding the effects of invasive species, climate change, nutrient loading, and hypoxia. Note that some of these models provide a snapshot or static picture of the system at a particular time period while others are dynamic. Further, all six of our modeling approaches have addressed the issues of invasive species, both those that are currently exist in the lakes and those that have, have high probability of invading the Great Lakes. Each of these modeling approaches have also been applied across many different ecosystems and habitats. These have ranged across four of the five Great Lakes, that is Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario different sections or habitats of some of these great lakes. Those being Muskegon Lake, Saginaw Bay, Western, Central, and Eastern basins of Lake Erie, and the Bia Quinte, Lake Ontario. Models have also been developed and applied for other ecosystems outside the Great Lakes, including Illinois River, Oneida Lake, Chesapeake Bay, the Tuxent River of the Chesapeake Bay, and the Northern Gulf of Mexico. This has tallied to the count of 24 models developed and five more currently in development. These efforts have also led to a total of 30 peer reviewed publications spanning across these modeling categories. Many individuals, approximately 112, spanning around 36 institutions have either provided data for our model developments or have worked directly with us on these models. Funding sources has also varied across the years ranging from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, Great Lakes Fishery Trust, EPA's GRI, its Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, NOAA NOS, the National Science Foundation, some academic contributions from universities for student support, and of course, rural based funds. Enough with the numbers. Now for some research highlights, that is my teasers. One of our approaches applied ecological and social network analysis to evaluate how invasive species have disrupted food webs in the Great Lakes. One particular item was the quantification of network compartments that illustrated how energy is partitioned and flows through a food web. Subgroups of strongly interacting taxa define a compartment, whereas much weaker interaction connect subgroups. These compartments within a food web increases the visibility of the food web, but invasive species can disrupt this food web structure potentially compromising the food web. Using the EcoPath with EcoSim framework, we model the potential consequences to the Lake Erie food web if invasive carp, that is big head carp and silver carp, 
were to invade the lake. What we found was interesting. Invasive carp could potentially make up to a third of the total fish biomass of the lake. In addition, they may negatively affect important food web groups such as zooplankton, crayfish, and some recreational important fish. However, there could also be some winners such as smallmouth bass. We also use an individual-based community model to understand the probability of basic carp establishment and food web effects in Saginaw Bay Lake John. The graphics show projected establishment rates shown by the box and whisker plots in response to number of carp invading the system. The south of the line is the carp biomass. BH is big-headed carp, high survival. SH is silver carp, high survival. The rows represent different survival rates of the group, the young of the year of the year, of various rates of young of the year carp survival. But the top plots represent the highest survival, with decreasing survival going from top to bottom. What we found was a few as 10 invasive carp could establish a population assuming a high or intermediate age zero survival. At least 100,000 individuals may be needed to establish a population assuming low A0 survival. Not shown here are two more conclusions from the study. CARP had a negative effect on plankton and planktivorous fish biomass, with percent impact of function of invasive CARP biomass. But some species, in this case walleye, may actually benefit from the presence of invasive CARP as an additional food resource. Moving on to quantifying habitat quality and quantity for walleye in Lake Erie in response to hypoxia using spatial explicit model of growth rate potential. Shown here are transects collected in the central basin using a towed vehicle with CTD and fisheries acoustics. From top to bottom is water temperature, dissolved oxygen, crayfish biomass, growth rate potential with hypoxia, and growth rate potential assuming no low DL. The color color bar represents high intensity with the highest value, with the purple representing lowest values. On the left is day, on the right is night. Good habitat is defined as growth rate potential greater than zero grams per gram per day. We found the average monthly quantity of high quality habitat for walleye declined slightly by about 2% hypoxia. But hypoxia appeared to enhance habitat quality by concentrating prey in favorable temperature, DO, and light conditions. Highlighting some recent work using the Atlantis Ecosystem 3D Modeling Framework for Lake Michigan, we model potential effects of vertical mixing on the food web. This is part of our ongoing efforts of looking at climate change effects. The effect on vertical mixing was our first step as it is expected that climate change will affect the timing and duration of vertical stratification and thus the transfer, the vertical transfer of materials. Our efforts here suggest that the biomass of most functional groups increased with increased vertical mixing. With the greatest increases in phytoplankton, zooplankton, and benthic invertebrates. Increased biomass was due to the replenishment of nutrients into the euphotic zone, which enhanced growth biomass at lower trophic levels. Filtration by invasive mussels reduced the positive effect of vertical mixing for many species. This is important in the context of climate change, as it's expected to be less, again, less vertical mixing in various climate change scenarios. Our last example highlights a linked food web model, the social economic model to evaluate how the regional economies might change during various preceding muscle reduction scenarios. What we found was that there is a different effect between Lakes Michigan and Erie in economic response to muscle control. For Lake Erie, increased muscle control resulted in positive economic benefits, but a much reduced rate of increased muscle reduction. For Lake Michigan, increased muscle control resulted in increase in economic benefits.
Through our food web efforts, we also have produced some outreach products. These have included a graphical fold-out insert for the National Geographic magazine, shown on the left. In the center are popular food web brochures, often used by teachers. And on the far right, an example of some of our fact sheets. So what's happening in the next 25 years, or at least the next five to 10? We have our NOAA Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative, which we call CEPI, where we will continue to develop the Atlantis Ecosystem Modeling Framework for Lake Michigan and expand it to the other Great Lakes. Develop new models with new developments, for example, ecospace, food web models, to contrast results across different modeling approaches. And we further address the interacting effects of climate with other multiple stressors on the Great Lakes food webs. Furthermore, we'll continue expansion of our models to evaluate potential effects of future invaders and continue our developments of the potential interactive and feedback effects between food web and social economic models. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, again, I'm not here today, but Ed Rutherford is there and he can address any questions. Thank you for listening.